These are the words from Paul to the Corinthians. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and angels but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body to be burned but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, knows all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Prophecies will come to an end. Tongues will cease. Knowledge will come to an end. We know in part. We prophecy in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. Now we see in a mirror, in a riddle. Then we will see face to face. Now I know in part, then, then I will know fully. Now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. This morning's sermon title, Clarity is Kindness, is in quotes because it's a statement that isn't my own, but those of Ahn Tron, PhD candidate at the Harvard Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, whose research is focused on power, ethics, and statecraft with a focus on Buddhist communities in French colonial Southeast Asia. On graciously gave me permission to include this statement of hers here today, and I thank On for that. While she meant it when she shared it with me and my peers in the context of academic writing, when she said it, I immediately began to understand that there was a deeper teaching here for me and perhaps one for all of us here, too. I first began to learn from Ann in the fall of 2020. It was my first semester at Divinity School, and it was all virtual. My dog, Foxy, and I would spend our days in my apartment in Miami, Florida, I on Zoom, she at my feet. I had been called to go back to graduate school after a career in law and then one in teaching high school students. I was hopeful, full of faith in where life was calling me to be, and also deeply afraid of contracting and spreading COVID to my family, of not being up to the task of what this new religious vocation was expecting of me, scared of not doing enough for our country. I say all this to give some context for the time. I say that as if my body has forgotten. It hasn't. Maybe yours hasn't either. 
Not entirely. And why would it? It's only been four years. And it's been four years. And yet, I also remember to remind myself that clarity is kindness. When Ahn first taught that, I was in the context of this academic writing in the study of religion. See, I had the great fortune to have Ahn as my teaching fellow for the course I was dreading the most, theories and methods. Prior to this class is my many, too many, all, already too many years of schooling. I had never taken a class strictly on theory. What was it? It sounded daunting, and it intimidated me. I loved to write. I still do, always have. But could I write for them, these academics? And who were they, anyway? What did they want from me? Did they want anything from me? And more daringly, what did they want of themselves? What I now deem Ahn's writing maxim of love, yes, love, clarity is kindness, removed all that surface fluff for me. If what on my trusted TF teaching fellow was telling me was true, and I heard the truth in those three prophetic words as soon as she uttered them, then being clear and being kind to my readers, to my peers, to my potential colleagues was all I needed to focus on. If I could work to bridge the divides in understanding, first in my heart, in my mind, then I could reach others. My writing could serve as an invitation to engage in thinking and possibly even feeling together. It could be collaborative, not divisive. And then there came a new lesson, a deepening into the idea. For I would come to learn something that so many of us, so many of you have known already. At the most complex problems and theories often take time and nuance for us mere humans to arrive at some form of clarity. Perhaps that's why, intuitively, the biblical verse in today's reading is one that I've been drawn to since high school. In 1 Corinthians, Paul addresses the real-life implications of living into the values upon which this burgeoning community he founded was based upon, the gospel of Jesus. There were about 50 members, both Jews and Gentiles, meeting in one house church. The community was diverse, both socially and racially and ethnically, which may have caused the power struggles and differences of opinion that threatened the unity of the infant church. At this time, the port city of Corinth was one of the most important cities in Greece. It was the provincial capital of one of the Roman provinces and was situated at the crossroads of major travel and trade routes. Because of its geographical position, Corinth was full of diverse cultural influences and religious practices. Paul, already having left Corinth and this community for Ephesus, writes back to them, counseling them on their struggles. He explains how Christians can be faithful to their calling when their values are likely at odds with the surrounding culture and when the diversity in the community causes differences of opinion. In this text, Paul reminds the Corinthians that all their spiritual gifts are as nothing unless they have love. 
So how about us? Are we being clear about who we are, about what we believe in, about what values ground us, about where we turn to when we aren't finding the spiritual clarities our bodies yearn for. Hundreds of years later, that central message to love is one we find in our proposed Article 2 in the Unitarian Universalist Association, which we are being asked to vote upon this summer. Love remains at the core of Unitarian Universalist theology, if we let it. More so, if we continue to center it in our work, ineffable and even trite as it may sometimes seem, given the culture that surrounds us and the way that others may use this term. Yet what we mean by love is and can be something deeply interpersonal, reciprocal, spiritually grounded, the politically powerful. I could write a hundred versions of this sermon and it would still be lacking in clarity. I'm convinced. Yet what is important and what I believe we can teach one another as Paul is attempting to reach, reteach his beloved Corinthians is that none of us can achieve total clarity in knowledge or prophecy or tongues in this lifetime. That there is some other force at play, spiritual force which he calls God, that sees who and what we can become because we are already all of these things in love. Looking in the mirror, looking back, being seen. So I am here with you all in the striving, in the attempt at clarity, at kindness of word and deed. May we continue to name and call each other into this sacred, unending, loving work together.